Hello and welcome to Christ Church Online. We're so glad that you've joined us here today. And happy Mother's Day to all of you moms out there. And before you get too settled into the service, we'd love to know how you do church online. So let me invite you, just take out a camera or a, a phone and take a picture of your living room or your kitchen or you worshiping together today. We'd love to see that. And you can send it in to communications at christchurchil.org. We're about to have some great worship and reflection time. Uh, and then we're gonna hear from a mom who has some lessons that she's learned amidst the challenges of sheltering in place. I think it'll be an encouragement to not just the moms out there, but to all of us as well. Welcome to Christ Church Online. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all king mm. who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all king this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you will lay down your life that i would be set
I am Kate Gleick and I attend the Christ Church Crossroads campus with my husband and our four boys. Something that's been really great about staying home right now is the fact that we get to slow down. My kids go to school about 20 minutes away from our house and so during the school year I spend two to four hours driving back and forth to school every day and that's two to four hours a day now that I get to be with them. So we get to play board games together and watch movies and I get to hear more about what's going on in their lives. We have more time to just sit and talk. Being a mom is really hard even in the easiest time, even when it's sunny out and you can get out and do a ton of things and see all your friends. Um, it's hard and this time is hard, harder than I could have even imagined. But I think one of the most important things we can do is, is be together even when we're not together. Uh, Pastor Mike talks a lot about 2 a.m. friends and I think that this is a time where 2 a.m. friends come, to, come in really handy. We aren't alone and we have to reach out to each other. We have to have a community. And I have found that in Christ Church, through small groups, um, through affinity groups, and I honestly couldn't be doing this if I didn't have my girls. On Monday nights, I am part of an affinity group for moms that have kids at home. And there are about 10 people that are signed up for it, and usually about six of us get together. And we just talk for an hour from eight to nine 
but it's all we do. We talk about what's going on and sometimes we're doing really, really good and we can laugh about funny things our kids did and sometimes we're not doing good and we can share with each other the frustrations of trying to work at home, trying to figure out how you work and make lunch and get kids naps, but we can do it together and it makes it feel like we're not so alone. Uh, one verse that I cling to all the time, and especially right now, it's actually on my wall, and it's in Luke, and it says that blessed is she who believes the Lord will fulfill his promises to her. And I cling to that verse because even though everything feels like it's falling apart and I have no idea what's coming around the corner next, I know that God will always fulfill his promises to me. Once again, we're so glad that you're here worshiping with us today. If this is your first time joining Christ Church Online, we'd love to know that, and we'd love to know how we might be able to serve you. If you would text the number that's showing up on your screen, that would allow us a chance to respond to you and give us an opportunity to hear how we might be able to come alongside you in whatever way during this time. Obviously, the COVID-19 pandemic has caused disruption around the globe through food shortages, job shortages, stress on businesses and organizations of every kind, and as you know, we're doing what we can to help. Our COVID Opportunity Task Force has given away over $36,000 in the last several weeks. And just recently, we've had a chance to serve a couple of needs, uh, that um, one in our area and one around the world. So the Luke 311 Share Center is a food pantry up in Lake Villa. We've been able to help them meet needs in the Northern Lake County area. And then the Scholar Leaders International Organization has been doing work in areas that have a little access to much needed relief supplies. So we were able to help them as well. And your generosity is what makes this possible. So thank you for leaning into sacrificial giving during this time. Wanna encourage you to continue to give as much as you are able. The give button on our website is maybe the easiest way to give, but there are lots of different ways uh, that you can show your generosity through your gifts during this time. And we are so thankful for it. I want to talk about one opportunity that's coming up actually tomorrow night. Uh, Pastor Mike will be leading a Zoom call called Behind the Scenes, where he's going to be talking about how the church is functioning during this time, a little bit of a behind the scenes look, uh, and share also how we're thinking about restart phases. Obviously, uh, we're following the different guidelines for our state, but it'll give you a chance to ask your questions and interact with Mike about uh, just w the way the church is handling things operationally during this time. So would encourage you and invite you to be a part of that. Well, in just a moment, Mike's going to come with a special Mother's Day message. But before he does, we're going to be led in prayer by James Chambers. Uh, James and his wife, Katie, work with InterVarsity Fellowship at nearby Lake Forest College uh, and have been doing work with our staff on starting spiritual conversations. And we'd love to invite you to be a part of some of that training as well. This Wednesday night, James is leading a Zoom call to help us think about how we might start spiritual conversations with others that we interact with. So would encourage you this Wednesday night, take advantage of that opportunity as well. But right now, James is going to lead us in prayer, and then Mike's going to come after that. Once again, welcome to Christ Church Online. Happy Mother's Day to you all. Let's pray. Father, thank you in your word in Psalm 92. You said that the righteous would flourish like a palm tree and grow like the cedars in Lebanon, that those that are planted in your house would flourish in the courts of their God. I pray that for the mothers, I pray that for the children, the fathers that are listening under the sound of my voice. Lord, I ask that you would grow us as planted trees in righteousness so that we can flourish in all of the beautiful gifts you have for our families and for those that we come in contact during this time. Father, I pray a special blessing over the mothers and their relations with their children. Lord, I ask that you would bring comfort and peace to their hearts, bring memories of joy, prayers for their children, and even great gifts and good surprises for them to be experienced in this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Mommy, thank you so much for always being there for us, for loving us, and for playing with us. Thank you for reading me books at night. It calms me down. Mommy, thank you for being my homeschool teacher. Mom, I love you because you help me with difficult subjects in school. Dear Mom, thank you for always loving me and being there for me unconditionally. Mom, thank you for not losing your sanity yet with all five kids at home during this quarantine. 
Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Thank you so much for always encouraging me and my gifts and to be able to use the unique skills and abilities that I've been given to be able to honor everybody around to serve and to be able to use those. Mom, even though you're not with us physically this Mother's Day, I just want to thank you for being an incredible example to me of a woman who leaned in on God and never gave up on her faith in the good times and in the tough times. Thank you for raising me to love God. Thank you for creating such a happy and joyful home for me to grow up in. Thank you for always sacrificing and putting yourself last and making whatever we had seem like enough. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. I wanna take this moment to thank you for those amazing biscuits that you made me a couple of weeks ago. You are still a phenomenal cook. I also want to thank you for those uh, being a wonderful mother and demonstrating what uh, motherhood is all about. Mom, I know you're in heaven with uh, grandma, grandpa, and my uncles and family. Um, thank you for all of the love, care, and heart you poured into me. The man of God that I'm growing to become is because of you and dad. You are a strong and humble servant. Mom, Mother's Day will be different without you this year. I will be sad and I will miss you. But mostly, I am thankful for your sweet spirit your love of God, family, and friends, and your lasting influence on our lives. Thanks, Mom. So I heard a story about 11 people who are hanging on a rope that is uh, suspended from a helicopter. And at some point, it is determined that this rope can't uh, support all 11 of them and somebody needs to let go. Uh, it's 10 men and one woman, and nobody wants to let go. And finally, after some consultation, the woman says, look, I'll let go. I am, I am a, a mom. I'm used to sacrificing myself on behalf of others. And uh, as she says this, all the men begin to clap. <laughs> so today is the day we all let go of the rope and clap and uh, pretend that um, in serving brunch or calling or sending flowers or a Hallmark card that um, we're all even. Uh, perhaps not quite. I have a file, I have files on lots of topics. It's part of what I do, but uh, I have a Mother's Day file and I was reading over it this week and I ran across an old article by Garrison Keeler on mothers. And he suggested that when it comes to payback, that a um, uh, million dollars in a home in the south of France would be a good starting point. Um, I'm not able to control any of that. Uh, I do believe, uh, do recognize, I should say that, uh, again, flowers in a Hallmark card uh, is probably not um, gonna call it even, nor is a sermon on Mother's Day, but I do wanna reflect today out of Exodus chapter 34 on moms and on God. And it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit of a thank you to moms, but it's mostly designed as an encouragement to all of us because God describes himself um, in a couple different passages and Exodus 34 is one of them. There's some, uh, the love of a mom is part of the way that God describes himself. And that's, uh, that's a bonus for moms and it's an encouragement to all of us. So this is Exodus 34 is the 10 commandments take two. As you may remember, Moses gets called up to Mount Sinai to get the 10 commandments the first time and that happens and then, uh, but he's up there a long time and by the time he gets down, they've sort of given up on Moses and you've got the whole Aaron and golden calf and Moses is so mad and so frustrated with the people that he throws the 10 commandments down and they, they shatter. So later on, he goes back up the mountain at God's uh, request and he gets the 10 commandments a second time. So that's what we're reading here. Exodus chapter 34, I begin reading with verse four. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first and he rose early in the morning and went up to the mount, on Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him and he took in his hand the two tablets of stone. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him 
and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, and the, the term that's used here is the, uh, the covenant name of God, Yahweh, I am who I am, I will be who I will be, I am, uh, the self-referential one. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. So um, I, wanna, I wanna help you understand a little bit more about this passage. It's something that's relatively easy to miss in the English, but would be much more noticeable in the Hebrew. So let me back up for just a second and, um, and reflect on how we all have come to be here. As you know, because of COVID, I'm preaching in an empty room, and so I can only imagine where you're, where you're at, who you are, and where you're at. Um, my guess is that some of you are sitting in a living room on a couch. Maybe there's three or four of you um, gathered together around a TV. Some of you have this sermon on on a laptop, perhaps on the kitchen counter while you're I don't know, making pancakes or waffles or cleaning up from pancakes or waffles. Some of you may be with your moms. Uh, Mother's Day is historically the third largest uh, church attendance weekend uh, of the year behind Easter and Christmas Eve. It turns out that when you ask moms what they want for Mother's Day, many of them say, I want my children to go with me to church. So perhaps you have gathered with your mothers today, or maybe not because of social distancing or physical distancing issues. Some of you may fall into what we refer to as a more traditional family image, which means you have smaller kids at home, which almost certainly means <clears throat> that the kitchen is pitted out at this point. Some of you are single moms. Some of you are alone. Uh, Mother's Day is always uh, a... A, a, a collection of things. And speaking to moms on Mother's Day is always a bit of a, of a high wire dance because our lives are complicated. The Bible actually has a, a stunningly honest portrayal of family life. And it does not suggest anything like a Hallmark uh, commercial. The Bible's image of families is uh, stories of tension and stress and disappointment and rivalries and estrangements and finger pointings and affairs, uh, elder abuse, murder. Um, it, it sets up a much more accurate portrayal of what life looks like. So let me just note that um, all of us are broken and all of our families are broken in different ways and, and Mother's Day can, can cause a lot of guilt. Not everyone had a mom uh, around when they were growing up. Not everyone who had a mom uh, around when they were growing up had a mom that was as wonderful and gracious as we like to think about moms being, especially on Mother's Day. Not everyone who wants to be a mom is a mom. And not every mom thinks that they are doing or thinks that they did a good job as a mom. There are lots of ways that this day causes stress. Um, this time of year, there's a statement that pops up different places and it says, God can't be everywhere, so he gave us mothers. Uh, sounds nice, I, I just wanna point out, God actually can be everywhere. Um, David reflects on this in Psalm 139. Where can I go that I would ever be away from your spirit? God is, God is omnipresent. He is, he is everywhere. And the other problem with this, this statement is that it just can cause a lot of guilt. Like, okay, so God can't be there, so moms just fill in on that assignment. So um, it's stressful. I think personally, I always think Father's Day is a little bit um, more stressful because I, I suspect my experience, my read is that more fathers are sideways with children um, than moms are. Fathers often, and this comes out in Ephesians 6 where Paul writes and says, you know, fathers do not provoke your children. Fathers can often push too hard um, and, and end up estranged from their children. Uh, so there's problems with Father's Day. There's problems with Mother's Day. I wanna acknowledge that, but I also do want to reflect on what God says uh, about himself and about moms. 
So what you think about God is the second most important thing about you. That's a deliberately provocative statement because it leads you to say, well, what's the most important thing about me? Well, I would say what God thinks about you <laughs> is the most important thing about you. But what you think about God, what I think about God, is the most important thing we think. And, and I, I mean this in two ways. First of all, what God is to me. So we are wired as people uh, to seek meaning. We are wired to worship. We are going to organize our thoughts, our hopes, our loves around certain things. And that can be any one of a, a variety of things. Some of, some of us can desperately love and, and elevate it to an unhealthy level. Our children or our job or uh, our reputation or money or whatever. There's all kinds of things, almost all of them good things that we promote beyond their station. That's why the, the topic of idolatry is perhaps the biggest topic in the Bible. So we can get this wrong in that in, as opposed to having a connection with the God who is, uh, we, can, we can fill that God-shaped vacuum with something else. However, there's a second way we can get this wrong, and that is uh, we can say, well, I actually do believe in the God that, that is represented on the pages of Scripture. I do believe uh, in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I believe that the God who, is, who has revealed himself, uh, not just in creation, but in his Son, uh, and in the book of Hebrews, uh, we're told that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. So, so. Some of you, I mean, this is a Christian worship service. Some of you would say, yes, I affirm Jesus Christ and I believe in the God who is revealed uh, on the pages of Scripture. Um, however, <laughs> our understanding of what that God is like can also be skewed. So God reveals himself to us uh, in Scripture principally as a father more than as a mother. Uh, Jesus, when he taught us to pray the Lord's Prayer, our Father, Abba, Dad, our Father who art in heaven. And uh, throughout the, the Old Testament, we have uh, numerous references to God as Father. And, and then in the parables, Jesus describes God as, as the Father of the prodigal, the Father who loves, who runs to protect his Son. God is also portrayed in other parables and in other ways uh, anthropomorphically as a judge or as a shepherd or as a king. There's a lots, of, lots of different images that we are given of God. God is bigger than we can comprehend, so we're given handles to hold on to. But one of the handles that we're given uh, in Exodus 34 compares God to being a mother. So this passage, again, written by Moses, so written, you know, 3,500 years ago in the ancient Near East, teaches us some interesting things about God. So at the time that this, the book of Exodus is being written, at the time of Moses, um, lots of people believed that the, that the world was spiritually charged, uh, we, we often will refer to this period as the time of the God of the gaps. So if I can't understand why something is happening, people would ascribe all of that to God. I, they don't understand a storm. They don't understand uh, a, a disease. They don't understand something. And so they attribute the actions that they don't understand to, to God. So we talk about this as the God of the gaps. And of course, as science came along, the gaps got smaller and smaller. And and, and that whole way of thinking of God, I think, is skewed. And this week, I'm going to, as an aside, I'm going to have a chance to interview uh, John Lennox, very prominent um, scientist, Oxford uh, professor. Um, he's debated all the big names, Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens and others, on the topic of science and faith. And, um, and he talks a lot about how we should not understand God to be the God of the gaps. But back then... There, were, there was lots of gods of the gaps, and people believed in a world that was spiritually supercharged. And so there were all kinds of gods, and you were always doing whatever you could to try and appease them. Because uh, the general understanding, if you read the Greeks and the Romans, you know, the gods are very finicky, 
and you want to stay on their good side or at the very least stay off of their bad side. Perhaps you remember your world civ class in high school. Probably not, but perhaps you remember the story uh, about the Greek uh, king uh, Agamemnon who was trying to get his, uh, his troops to the Trojan battle. But um, he, as he's got them all and they're sailing there, the, the seas across the Mediterranean, the, the wind dies down and all the boats are dead in the water. And he believes that it is the Greek uh, god uh, Artemis who is angry. And so he sacrifices his daughter as an appeasement uh, to try and placate Artemis so that he can get her favor. So this is how God is, gods are understood. At the time that God reveals himself uh, more fully to Moses, and to the Jewish people and their slaves, and he frees them from their Egyptian captivity. And then he supernaturally protects them and cares for them. And he gets them through the Red Sea and he gets them into the desert and he provides food, you know, manna at night. He provides water. He keeps them alive. He cares for them. He rescues them. They have done absolutely nothing to deserve any of this, but he continues to do this for them. Who is this God? Well, it turns out he is a God who is, in our text today, Exodus 34, 6. He is a God who is compassionate and gracious. Now, in Hebrew, there's a play on words here. It's hahun ve hanum. And th- th- these words, that I-, I can't, I, I don't speak Uh, Hebrew. It's much more guttural when they say it, but the words sort of rhyme a little bit, and there's a play that's going on here. If you listen to the morning devotions that I've been sending out, we we had this in Philippians chapter 1, verse, uh, I think, 21, where Paul says, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And in the Greek, it's to live is Christos, to die is kerdos. And there's a, there's a play going on here. There's a punch, there's a rhyme. And we've got that here in these two words, hahun ve hanum. And the, the first word means compassionate, but it's usually translated merciful. What you have to understand is the root of this word is the same word for a female womb. And the idea is this compassion, this mercy is similar to the feelings that a mother has for her infant child. So what we're being told here, in a sense, there is an illusion being made to God having these maternal loving qualities and characteristics for you. That's what we're being told. The Lord feels for you like a mom does for her infant child. This is quite a statement about God, and it's quite a statement about moms, right? Now, I wanna say thank you to moms, and I want us all to be encouraged. And I wanna pause again and recognize that Tragically, for some of you, this doesn't connect because your family of origin was so warped or your family of origin is currently so misshapen that you have no idea what it would be like to have a compassionate, merciful parent. Perhaps your dad is always mad at you and your mom is, is more the perfectionist and, and sort of driving and nagging you. Uh, you were never smart enough or athletic enough or pretty enough or whatever. Um, maybe your parents just weren't around. So I understand for some reason the idea of, of Yahweh being a parent may not completely connect with you. But for others of you, I hope this taps into a very deep sense of resonance in your soul, especially if you've been a parent yourself. Because you know that uh, the love of a man for a woman, the love of a a soldier for his country, the love of of a athlete for their team, none of these things in one sense compare to the raw, sort of uh, untamable love that a parent will feel for a child, especially for an infant child that you're called upon (laughs) to care for and protect.
And that is how God feels for you. I share, I've shared several times a story about uh, being involved in a, in a failed effort to rescue a dad who had gone in to save his children. Um, it, this was in, a, in, a, in the lake, Lake Michigan, and, and the dad had been successful in getting his children uh, rescued, and a number of other people, we were able to help a number of other people, but we could not help this father. And I sort of lived with that failure uh, went on for some period of time, rehearsing over and over what we did, what we might have done, how we could have done this differently. And it was months that went by before the thought ever occurred to me that, that I had one of my boys with me, that I could have had one of my boys get in the water. And the thought just didn't occur because that's not the thought of a parent. Like the thought of a parent is, you no, know, I go. Like I would, I, I want to protect. Uh, it's unthinkable to send a child in that sense into harm's way. And that's sort of the, that's sort of the, the feeling that parents, and I want to think especially moms, have for their children. And that is the feeling, Exodus 34 says that God has for you. What you think about God right, is the most important thing you think, and it needs to be shaped by a God who's a bit like a mom. And this isn't the only place that we get this imagery in Isaiah chapter um, 49. It says, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? <laughs> It's a rhetorical question. No. Can a mom forget a child that is nursing uh, at the time? No, there's no possible way. But though she may forget, I will not forget you. This is God speaking to you. Though a mom might forget a child she's nursing, right? I will not forget you. I have engraved you on the palms of my hand. And then there's other place we get an imagery of, of God being like a mother hen who's trying to protect the chicks and pull them under her wings. So, yes, in the Bible, God is generally portrayed as father. And there are reasons for this. He is the father of Jesus. He's the father of all of those who believe in Christ and are adopted into the family. He's also compassionate like a mother. He has, he has compassion for you. So I want you to be encouraged. Thanks, mom. Thanks, moms. Thanks, mom, and thanks, moms, uh, for all you do. I hope that you have a good day. Being encouraged, and I want everyone to be encouraged, the radical portrayal of God's love. It's like the love that a mom has for an infant. That's the way he feels about you. Let me pray. Lord God, on this uh, Mother's Day, we ask for your grace and mercy and encouragement and a, and a sense of your mother's love for us. Recognize that all kinds of people are experiencing Mother's Day in all kinds of ways, and some are really hard right now. So I pray for those. Father, may may your love sort of overwhelm those circumstances. And may we all um, recognize the need to be more gracious and compassionate as Christ was, as you are, and uh, as so many moms are. So bless the rest of this day. We pray this in Christ's name, amen.
Till that stone was moved for good For the Lamb it conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs Once again, so glad you were with us today. And before we sign off, I want to invite you to check out this short video talking about the upcoming teaching series that we'll have in the next few weeks at Christ Church Online. Check this out. I'm so lonely. Why can't this end? Is it even worth putting in the effort? I just need something to change. They only act like they care. Why is everyone so fake? Why aren't more of my friends calling I'm tired of this. This is such a waste of time. Nothing good ever happens to me. Nobody even notices me. Who can I turn to for help? Who can I turn to for help? Who can I turn to for help? So we hope you'll join us over the next few weeks for this timely series. For this week, I want to remind you of the behind the scenes opportunity with Mike tomorrow night the opportunity Wednesday night for starting spiritual conversations with James Chambers. And for today, happy Mother's Day to all of you moms. I hope you have a great and blessed day. And for everyone, God bless you and have a great week.
Till that stone was moved for good For the Lamb it conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs <laughs>